My name is Robin Joel, and I am a third year law student at Harvard Law School. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about a project that I worked on as part of Harvard's Cyber Law Clinic. And our client for that project was OpenStreetMap US. You all might have heard of them. Uh, and I'm here to talk about the project, our goals, our processes, our outcomes. But I also wanted to talk about the experience of working with OpenStreetMap from the perspective of a non-community member. And ultimately, my hope is that this discussion will help three different sort of subsets of, of the community. The first is future law clinics or students working at law schools who are interested in engaging with OpenStreetMap. The second is other or outside organizations who want to engage with the OpenStreetMap community. And the third is OpenStreetMap US community members who are looking to form relationships and collaborate with outside organizations. So before I get too far, I want to introduce myself a little. As I mentioned, I'm a third year law student at Harvard, and I participated in our cyber law clinic. The cyber law clinic provides free legal services to clients related to uh, internet, technology, and intellectual property matters. The clinic is a way for students to get hands-on experience while we're still students. So although we're supervised by law school faculty members, I was supervised by Professor Susan Crawford, we really take the lead on engaging with clients and making client decisions. I became involved with the clinic because I'm interested in intellectual property law and I thought it would be a great way for me to sort of dip my toes in that world at an early stage in my legal career. And during the first week at the clinic, I was assigned to OpenStreetMap US as my client. I don't have any background in geography, GIS, uh, programming. My bachelor's degree is in international affairs, which meant that I had actually heard of OpenStreetMap in the context of an international development class I took where we discussed humanitarian aid, aid work in Haiti. But until I became involved with the clinic, I hadn't so much as logged on to OpenStreetMap. Uh, so I say that to stress the fact that I am very much an OpenStreetMap novice, just as I'm a novice in the law with only two-thirds of a law degree under my belt. Uh, I say that because I want to make clear that I'm not here to provide universal insights into how to solve problems related to the open database license uh, or to give ulti uh, you know, ultimate guidelines on how to partner with the OpenStreetMap community. I'm here to talk about my very specific experience engaging with OpenStreetMap, the ODBL, and geocoding, and to share what I would have done differently, with the hopes that the next iteration of these types of collaborations can build on my missteps. I'm also uh, an amateur baker, which is something we'll loop back to. I promise it's somewhat re relevant. All right, so the project. The CyberLaw Clinic's project revolved around the open database license. Our task was to explore the intersection between the license, OpenStreetMap, and geocoding, specifically from a legal perspective. We selected geocoding as our use case because it was often mentioned as a point of tension between the community and the license. Our goal wasn't to give a definitive interpretation of the license or of how it applied to geocoding. It was simply to identify the points of tension and to suggest steps moving forward that the community take, could take towards easing that tension. Our process was to talk to people. We conducted interviews with 10 different individuals from various parts of the OpenStreetMap US community. So that included large organizations like Mapbox, MapZen, and Telenav, and also some smaller groups. Uh, for instance, we spoke to an individual from a startup called Finder. Uh, we also spoke to community members who were engaged in academia, members of the licensing working group, and government uh, state government employees, um, among others. We asked them about how they used OpenStreetMaps, how they contributed, and also what they didn't use OpenStreetMap data for and why. The answers we received actually had a similar set of concerns. Our interviewees explained that, for the most part, they didn't use OpenStreetMap data for geocoding, and they gave two primary reasons for that. The first hinges on accuracy and completeness. OpenStreetMap data is primarily contributed by individual users. As a result, the database has more of some types of data than others. For instance, street information is very thorough, whereas address information and point of interest information tends to be a little bit spottier. There's more of it just in areas where the community tends to be larger. 
This makes it challenging to rely exclusively on OpenStreetMap data, especially when producing geocoding software that's meant for consumption by the general public. For instance, something like a navigation software. The second concern that we heard reiterated was a concern about share-alike obligations. Interviewees didn't take a firm stance against share-alike. What interviewees did say was that the scope of the obligations were at times unclear. And that made it a little scary to work with OpenStreetMap data for certain things. Risky. We heard from interviewees that they would be interested in using OpenStreetMap data as part of something like a geocoder, but that they were turned off by the uncertainty surrounding when the share-like provision would be triggered, especially when they're looking at supplementing OpenStreetMap data with other potentially pri proprietary data sources. In response to what we heard, we drafted a memo that addressed some of the concerns of the interviewees we spoke with and suggested uh, first steps and recommendations. Our recommendations fall under sort of three main uh, umbrella categories. The first is specificity. We recommended that OpenStreetMap consider the level of specificity at which it provides guidance. There are a great many resources available for community members or individuals who are looking to use OpenStreetMap for a project, but there currently aren't any geocoding specific resources. And so that's something that the, the community could consider developing. The next umbrella area of uh, recommendations that we had was clarity. As I mentioned, there are many resources available for those who are interested in using OpenStreetMap data for a project and for individuals who have questions. But those resources aren't always the most user-friendly. They overlap, they sometimes contradict each other. So really looking to streamline that is something that the community could do to ease uh, confusion and concerns about the scope of the license. And a strategy related to that would be perhaps having someone on the board, uh, on the US board, whose job it is to be the relationship point of contact, to connect individuals who have questions with those who might have answers. The third umbrella uh, area of recommendations is just reflecting on OpenStreetMap's mission. The interviewees that we spoke with and who reflected concerns about the scope of the license and how it interacted with geocoding represent a small slice of the overall community. And so, if making the data more usable for that, those types of projects isn't a priority, isn't part of what OpenStreetMap wants to have their mission be, then it isn't necessarily, it shouldn't necessarily be a priority to make big changes. We also suggested some avenues for future research, both for law clinic projects and then also just for community members. Uh, for law clinic students, we recommended projects such as analyzing the implication of different interpretations of the open database license, or providing options and recommendations for clarifying the content of existing community guidelines based on perspectives uh, expressed by the community. And the third would be drafting perhaps clearer geocoding use cases to demarcate permissible and impermissible uses of the data. For the community, I understand that sometime this weekend there will be a bird, uh, birds of feather, and then also just reading our memo. Uh, it's been distributed to the OpenStreetMap US board and also to the licensing working group, and it should be made available to uh, the general public sometime in the near future. So that is what we did. But the memo was actually a very small piece of the overall experience of working with OpenStreetMap US. Much of our time was spent adapting to working in an open source community. So in the lead up to this conference, I was trying to think of a really pithy anecdote to sum up um, the experience of working with OpenStreetMap US. And I wanted badly to sound like someone giving a TED talk and to have like a really great like psychological study I could talk about. Uh, but what I kept thinking about was cake. So I bake a lot in my free time, uh, mostly cakes and cookies, occasionally some bread. And for the 4th of July, I made a cake with a flag design in the center so that when you sliced each slice, it actually looked like an American flag. Uh, it's actually not as complicated as it seems, so I made some very rudimentary diagrams showing how you do it. Uh, you make four cake layers. You need two reds, one white, one blue. And you cut all the layers in half, and you cut a circle out of the middle of the layers, and then you just stack them uh, so that you have a flag. 
I don't have the steadiest of hands, so I had a friend helping me cut the cake layers in half and also double checking my arithmetic because I'm detail oriented and I wanted the proportions of my flag cake to match the actual proportions of an American flag. That was very important. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I had sprinkles. I had sprinkles that were silver for stars, but they weren't 50 and also I wasn't gonna make a cake tall enough to have 13 stripes, didn't have time for that. <laughs> um, but it turns out, after some Googling, that the field, that's like that blue rectangle on the, on the flag, is supposed to be 40% of the overall width of the flag. And so the other 60% lengthwise is supposed to be red and white. So I had an eight inch cake layer, so eight inch diameter cake, four inches in radius, and so I thought, given that information, that I needed to be cutting a five inch circle out of the middle of the cake. But my friend was vehemently insisting that it should be a three inch circle. We were both pretty stubborn, so things escalated and escalated and escalated <laughs> until we had spent a truly embarrassing amount of time and energy arguing about the uh, diameter of cake layers. At which point we realized there's actually more than one way to bake the cake. See, the way you build the cake depends entirely on whether you want the flag to face inwards <laughs> or outwards. Yeah, we were, we were both right. <laughs> um, but because we were talking past each other, it took us a long time to realize it. Uh, so the cake that I baked was, is the one on the yellow plate, and then the blue plate is the example of the alternative way to do it. Ultimately, both methods get you to the same place. Now, that seems like a pretty silly story, but it's actually a tidy summary of some of the takeaways I had from working with OpenStreetMap. My clinic partner and I struggled to adapt to working in an open source community. Law school is about problem solving. So we began the clinical experience confident that we were going to take a look at the license, maybe talk to some people, read a few cases, and then solve whatever problem we were presented with. That was, in retrospect, a little ridiculous. Uh, that's just not how an open source community works. A lot of our early conversations with Alyssa and Mikkel, who are our point of contacts for the project, were about how it wasn't our job to provide tidy answers because OpenStreetMap US just isn't a top-down hierarchy. An interpretation of the license or suggestions about uh, next steps for the community aren't going to be taken seriously if they don't involve some level of community buy-in and input. That was difficult for us because it flew in the face of the standard legal approach to problem solving. And it wasn't until we really pushed ourselves to acknowledge that there's more than one way to bake the cake, more than one way to build a strong open street map, that we were able to engage meaningfully with the project. With that in mind, I wanted to share what I believe are the three ingredients for success between a collaboration between OpenStreetMap US and outside organizations. The first is having difficult conversations early. If you take the time to brainstorm early on, whether about the way that you want your cake to look or the type of project that you want your law school, school clinics working on, you save yourself stress down the road. We rushed into the project, settling on OpenStreetMap US as our client for the clinic project because we needed to select a clinic project uh, client early in the semester, and OpenStreetMap US was willing to work with us. Rushing into that decision meant that the project attracted some negative attention early on, which for someone new to this community and this type of community was disheartening. Had we spent more time at the outset of the semester discussing the goals of the project and the ways in which we were going to engage with the community, there's a chance some of those road bumps could have been avoided. The next ingredient is just to listen. That's pretty straightforward, but it's also critical. There's been a lot of discussion in recent years about Sharealike and how corporate members of OpenStreetMap, the OpenStreetMap community feel about Sharealike and why. And so it was important that my partner and I look beyond that history and actually engage with and listen to our interviewees. That's part of what makes working with a law clinic or with any outside organization so valuable. The fact that we're a fresh set of eyes, unbiased participants who, um, aren't familiar with the scripted responses of the community to certain issues. It was remarkable how much common ground my partner and I were able to find when we asked questions of our interviewees and then really listened, not just to what they were saying, but to how they were saying it and to what they weren't saying. 
to connect it all back to cake baking. Listening is what moves you past desperately trying to convince someone why you need to be cutting a five inch circle out of the middle of your cake and closer towards actually creating something. The final ingredient is being open, and open to differences and flexible in the face of them. Being upfront and listening helps to get past some, some roadblocks. But there are some differences between working with an open source community and other organizations that can't be solved quite as easily. For example, we had several discussions at the outset of the project about issues of privilege and what would or would not be shared with the rest of the community. Our instinct, given our legal background and training, was, to, was for less transparency. Working in a closed setting is more efficient and encourages honesty between the client and their counsel. But when your client's an organization, and that organization prizes openness and collaboration, you have to think critically about how you're going to design a process that addresses the norms of both the client and the counsel. Questions that we considered was included whether or not to make our interview notes public, whether to make our interview memos public, whether to solicit community feedback on early drafts of our project or just to share the final version. Ultimately, we compromised. The OpenStreetMap US board held a town hall to discuss the project and created a Slack page for community members to give feedback, ask questions, give input. We also shared interview memos with our project coordinators, but didn't necessarily share those beyond that. And although we didn't solicit input on drafts, we do plan to make our final work product public and have already shared it with the board and with the licensing working group. Those compromises were inevitable, but if I was redoing the project, I actually might change the calibration of them, tilting more towards transparency as much as possible. Ultimately, the biggest takeaway from my flag cake metaphor, which I have now completely beaten to death, is that even when you're standing in an 85 degree kitchen covered in flour, arguing about the diameter of cake rings, it's important to remember that you're all there to make a metaphorical cake, or in this case, a very non-metaphorical map. So if I was asked to give advice to future law clinics working with OpenStreetMap, I'd advise them to be patient, to listen, and to embrace the open data norms that surround them even though there are certain aspects of that model that seem almost directly opposed to what you learn in the classroom. And as OpenStreetMap and its local chapters and its foundation consider if and when and how to work with law clinics, I encourage them to remember that we like to solve problems and to give tidy solutions, but that we can be encouraged to do other things. Though we are used to operating in a realm focused on compartmentalization, attorney-client privilege, and secrecy, we can adapt slowly towards a more multi-stakeholder approach. And I say all of this in recognition of the fact that there are certainly different ways to bake the cake or to build the map. But at the end of the day, what really matters is baking it the best that it can possibly be. Thank you. I think technically I have a few minutes for questions if anyone has any. Go months. Go for it. All right, so that was a big question. Uh, I don't know if 
everyone heard, but I think the heart of it was asking how to encourage uh, partners like government organizations to be willing to share um, national data with something like the OpenStreetMap community. Uh, I think to answer a very small part of that question, simplicity helps. Uh, the the instinct is often to give all of the all of the information to give people like links to like GitHub pages or like big documents discussing you know OpenStreetMap what we use the data for and what the project outcomes are going to be. But I think that that can be scary for organizations who just aren't as familiar with how the community structures and with open data. And so trying to really reflect on what you can give on like a one page document saying here's what it means to have something be open and here's what we could do with this data and here's the impact it'll have on you and making it seem less scary is a really important first step. Um, I think we're a little bit behind, so I'm going to get off the stage so someone else can talk. Uh, but I will be around. Please feel free to find me and ask me more questions. Thank you.